Introduction When I was ready to present before the throne of God the insignificant results of my labors in writing the first part of the most holy life of Mary, the mother of God, I wished to subject it to the scrutiny and correction of the divine light by which I had been guided in my shortcomings. I was very anxious to be consoled by the renewed assurance and benign approval of the Most High, and to know whether he wished me to continue or to abandon this work, which is so far above my lowliness. The Lord responded, saying, Thou hast written well and according to our pleasure, but we desire thee to understand that in order to manifest the mysteries and most high sacraments of the rest of the life of our only and chosen spouse, mother of our only begotten, thou hast need of a new and more exalted preparation. It is our wish that thou die to all that is imperfect and visible, and that thou live according to the spirit, that thou renounce all the occupations and habits of an earthly creature, and assume instead those of an angel, striving to attain in them a still greater purity and an entire conformity with what thou art to understand and write. In this answer of the Most High, I understood that such a high perfection of life and habits and such an unwanted exercise of virtues was proposed and required of me that, full of diffidence, I became disturbed and fearful of undertaking a work so arduous and difficult for an earthly creature. I felt within myself great repugnance rising up in the flesh against the spirit. The spirit called me with interior force, urging me to strive after the disposition which was required of me, and advancing as argument the pleasure of the Lord and the benefits accruing to myself. On the other hand, the law of sin, which I felt in my members, opposed the divine promptings and discouraged me by the fear of my own inconstancy. I felt a great distaste, which deterred me, and a great pusillanimity, which filled me with fear. In this excitement, I began to believe that I was not capable of treating about such high things, especially as they were so foreign to the condition and estate of a woman. Overcome by fears and difficulties, I resolved not to continue this work and to use all possible means to adhere to this determination. The common enemy knew my fear and cowardice, and, as his utmost cruelty is more aroused against the weak and disheartened, he made use of this very disposition to attack me with incredible fury. It seemed to him that I was left without help in his hands. In order to conceal his malice, he sought to transform himself into an angel of light pretending to be very solicitous for my soul and for my welfare. Under this false pretext, he perfidiously deluged me with his suggestions and doubts. He presented to me the danger of damnation and frightened me with punishments similar to those of the chief of the angels, since I had sought in my pride to comprehend what was above my powers and in opposition to God himself. He pointed out to me many souls who, professing virtue, were deceived by some secret presumption and by yielding to the insinuations of the devil, and he made me believe that in so far as I sought to scrutinize the secrets of the divine majesty, I could not but be guilty of pride and presumption, thus being already judged. He urged very strongly that the present times were ill-suited for such matters and sought to confirm his assertions by what happened to some well-known persons who were found to labor under deceit and error. He reminded me of the dread of the spiritual life in others, how great would be the discredit which would arise by any mistake of mine, and what evil effect it would have on those of little piety. All this I would know by experience and to my regret if I persisted in writing about this matter. 
And as it is true evidently that all the opposition to the spiritual life and the small esteem in which the mystic virtues are held is caused by that mortal enemy, so, for the purpose of doing away with Christian devotion and piety in many souls, he succeeds in deceiving some and in sowing the cockle among the good seed of the Lord. Thus he causes confusion and obscures the true sentiment concerning it, making it more difficult to distinguish the darkness from the light. I am not surprised to see him succeed therein, as the true discernment is the special work of God and of those who participate in his true wisdom and do not govern themselves only by earthly insight.